The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His full and sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world falls around me I rest and know that He has found me Christ the rock is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In part one of this episode, we began exploring several important questions and the answers in an effort to give us better scriptural understanding of the topic of prayer. To date, we have asked and answered two important questions, including, one, what is the proper biblical definition of the word prayer? And two, are there any prerequisites necessary for a person to successfully pray? As we ended part one of our study, we divided question three. Is there a selective mechanism God uses to answer prayer, or does God answer every prayer without regard into two parts? The first part was a sub-question asking, is there a selective mechanism God uses to answer prayer? As we continue our study in part two, we pick up where we left off by asking the second sub-question, question B, does God answer every prayer without regard? In general, we know that God is sovereign and can choose to do or not do whatever he chooses. At the same time, we know that God has revealed his nature and chooses to be consistent with his own nature and character. Thus, we have a track record revealed via scripture of God's faithfulness and reliability which we can safely trust. In so far as the question is concerned, Psalm chapter 66 verse 18, Isaiah chapter 59 verse 12, and John chapter 9 verses 31 cited earlier reveal that God does not hear the prayer of the wicked or unrighteous. Thus, When the atheist proclaims that there is no God because they prayed and God did not answer, they have inadvertently provided additional support for God's trustworthiness since at the outset God declares that he does not hear the prayers of the wicked. Now by disclaimer, the only exception we know of to this is the sincere prayer of those who seek repentance. 
If this were not the case, none of us would be able to seek repentance since we all begin and remain in sin, that is, separation from God, until God's Spirit draws us unto repentance. Thus, the first requirement for successful prayer is that one earnestly seeks and receives repentance of God through Jesus. Once we cross the threshold and become justified with God through faith in Jesus, we have the promise of access to God through faith in Jesus as our great and high priest. As sons and daughters through adoption, we can make our petitions through prayer and be heard. While we can say from a scriptural basis that God can and does hear the prayers of those who are his sheep, the next question is, Does God answer every prayer of every person who is truly a believer? The answer is yes, God answers every prayer. The answer God gives will ultimately fall into one of four categories. The answers are as follows. 1. Yes. 2. No. 3. Wait. 4. I have something that is better. The final component to the question of answered prayer is timing. Assuming submitted Christians reach the point in their walk that they are able to commit themselves to any of the above answers being valid, the next issue becomes how long will we wait to receive the answer in question? In short, the problem is one of patience. It is a question of man's timing versus God's timing. Unfortunately, Scripture nowhere provides a stopwatch or tape measure which we can use to determine when God will or will not provide one of the four answers in question. Instead, what we do know is whatever God's timetable is, although we may not know what it is until accomplished, we are assured that His timing is always perfect according to His will. There is a very revealing scriptural incident found in Daniel chapter 10, verses 2 through 14, which gives us a rare behind-the-scenes look at prayer, which provides great insight regarding the topic of prayer's timing. Chapter 10, verse 2, begins saying, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine into my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till the three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittichel, then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. Verse 10 continues, saying, And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words." But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days." In this instance, the Jewish people had been in captivity in Babylon. Daniel, upon reading earlier scripture, realized that God had predicted the captivity would only be for 70 years, and that was almost finished. Daniel began to pray, fast, and intercede on behalf of his people in anticipation of their return to Jerusalem and be free. In this case, we know that it was God's will for the Jewish people to be freed from their captivity and to return to Jerusalem. Thus, Daniel directed his prayers to agree and to move his people and himself into alignment with God's will. Daniel continued his prayer, fasting, and intercession for 24 days. 
It is only after this period of time that a quote-unquote certain man arrives on scene and informs Daniel that God had heard his words the first day he began praying. Indeed, not only did God hear, but God had a predetermined answer according to his promise, which was ready for Daniel. The delay of 24 days was due to the fact that the prince of the kingdom of Persia had withstood the certain man causing struggle. Michael the archangel was required to assist in the struggle against the prince of the king of Persia and to help the certain man bring the answer to Daniel. Now, if you're not aware, the prince of the king of Persia referred to was not any earthly ruler. The reason we know this is because neither the king of Persia nor any other man living or dead is any match for any angel, much less Michael the archangel, who is recorded by scripture as being the chief among the angels. Historically, when angels show up to do battle against men, 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35, records that in that case, 185,000 soldiers died in one night. What this episode reveals is that even when the answer to prayer is according to God's will, there can be, and often is, opposition from our adversary, the devil. Opposition, as in this case, frequently translates to delay, because at its heart, when we are truly sincere about harmonizing our life with God's will, we enter into the arena of spiritual warfare. As a result, in some cases, even though the answer may be yes, according to God's will, the timing to that yes can be contingent on many factors seen only by God not the least of which is spiritual warfare and resistance by Satan. Question 4. Is there a formula to be found for successful prayer? Finding a formula for success would depend on defining what success looks like. None of us have a problem asking something in prayer and experiencing a resounding yes as the answer. It only becomes difficult due to our carnal nature to experience hearing no, wait, or I have something better. Few people would accept no to answer prayer as being success. If we are honest, yes is the answer we are looking for. Yes is the answer we define as being success. If we don't experience a quick yes, we believe there must be a problem. If time continues and yes still has not come, it is easy for doubt, frustration, anger, and disillusion to grow. Now, if you are or have ever been a parent, it doesn't take long to experience having your child ask you for something to which you must say no for their own well-being. From the parent's standpoint, you know that saying no is ultimately based upon your love for the child. You don't want to do anything which causes detriment to your child. However, sometimes, regardless of explanations, the child may see no as being synonymous with you don't love me. It takes time and experience for the child to see and understand the greater picture which demonstrates the fact that a parent who has real love, who has tough love for their child, is willing, as the price of their love, to endure temporary disappointment, frustration, anger, doubt, and disillusionment. In these cases, yes would easily avoid the temporary pain and discomfort, but the parent who knows what would result from yes is willing to say no for the greater good which the child does not yet understand. Now, if we can understand this earthly scenario between the role of a parent and a child, how much more can we say about the love of a perfect, holy, and loving God who knows all things throughout eternity and who can number the hairs of the head of those who are his children? The moral of this story is that we need to reevaluate our definitions of success when it comes to prayer. We need to ask, Is the definition of success compelling God to give me what I pray for and want in my life? Or is success surrendering myself via prayer to what God asks for and wants in my life? In the end, prayer is one of three things. 
One, prayer is either a list of demands, wants, or expectations from man to God. Two, prayer is a Christmas list of hopes and wishes that God may or may not fulfill randomly at his discretion. Or, three, prayer is a vehicle designed to move the petitioner closer to God and his will. History has too often shown various perhaps well-meaning but misguided and anti-scriptural approaches to supposed successful prayer. At its core, some would have us believe that there is a formula to be found in scripture or other places whereby any human can utter a word or words alone or to perform or refrain from performing an action or actions which somehow force or compel God to do or not do something for the one praying. While it is clear from Scripture that God has only and always what is in the best interest of those who are his sheep, the difficulty is for us who are his sheep to know in fact what is best. Our best may or may not be what God knows as being best. Conversely, what we see as being less than best or perhaps even worst may provide opportunity for God to do his best. The end result is that success is a relative term which is defined and known only to God and which is explained only in eternity. The best that we can do for the present is to exercise faith and to be secure in the knowledge that according to Romans chapter 8 verse 28 it says, quote, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Unquote. Question 5. What, if anything, does prayer change? Does prayer change God's mind, or is it man who conforms his mind to God's? As was stated in the answer to question 4, the purpose of prayer is not to move God to our will or our way of thinking. Rather, prayer is intended to help each of us move closer into alignment with God. There are many instances within scripture which record statements saying that God repented or that God turned from doing one thing to doing another. For some, these statements would erroneously indicate that God was somehow in error or that he needed to correct himself. Instead, what we need to understand is that because man is finite, he often has difficulty finding any language to fully articulate the issues of God's nature, which is eternal and perfect, as it relates to his interaction with his creation. We must remember that God and his will are eternally perfect. God does not change his nature or attributes, nor does God repent since he has never done anything to repent of. Instead, when we find statements indicating God is changing and or repenting, what we realize is that it is man who is changing and or repenting from the imperfection of our will to the perfection of God's will. The concept is one of perspective. If, for example, I drive my car towards a fixed point such as a building, it might appear from one perspective that the building is coming closer to me. But the reality is that it is I who am moving closer to the building. The great difference is that God is not an inanimate object. We can say on the authority of scripture that God does not move, change, or repent of any of his attributes, characteristics, or nature. As a result, we can say that God is faithful and trustworthy. At the same time, because man is finite and fallen, God must and does for our sake not only move toward, but in many cases joins each of us to perform those things which we ourselves are incapable of doing in and of ourselves. This movement by God is sometimes dramatic, sometimes imperceptible, sometimes understood, oftentimes past understanding. And it is within this movement that we, from our limited faculties, have the illusion that God is the problem, when in fact trusting God is the solution. 
The reality of this truth is spoken nowhere better than Romans 8, chapter 28, which says that as long as one is a believer, God is working all things together for our good. In this respect, prayer is not only God's way of enlisting man in that which God is doing, but is the opportunity for man of changing the framework of what is impossible using man's abilities to doing what man would say is impossible through God's providence. Question 6. If a prayer goes unanswered, does this mean that there is some problem with the person petitioning? As has been pointed out, successful prayer is contingent on first having access to God via a relationship with Jesus. Jesus himself confirms this in John chapter 14, verse 6, which says, quote, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, unquote. This verse and others tell us that prayer is exclusively for believers and God only hears and answers prayers through his Son. Jesus is not one way among many. He is the only way. Secondly, as previously mentioned, yes is not the only answer God grants to prayer. Sometimes God's perfect will from the perspective of eternity necessitates no wait, or I have something better as an answer. If we honestly examine the history of our lives, most of us would be able to recall a situation or an issue which we prayed earnestly that God would affect in some way. After time passed, and the answer we hoped for was different from what we wanted, we might likely look back and be thankful that what we asked for was not granted. In this scenario, what we first assumed to be a problem with us, or with prayer, was in fact a matter of time and perspective. It is important then to remember that when current reality does not seem to conform to our expectations, that what can seem to be a problem may in fact provide opportunity for a blessing. Man can only see in part the present whereas God can see around the corner and knows the future. It is easy to praise God for the resounding yes to prayer. Remember to praise God for the prayers he says no to also. Question 7. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 says, quote, Pray without ceasing, unquote. Now, initially, it would be easy to conclude that God is saying that believers are instructed to pray 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, every year, without ever stopping to sleep, eat, or rest. However, the Greek word translated without ceasing is adeleptos. The Greek word adeleptos is in turn a compound of two Greek words. The first Greek word is dia, which means through, as in the sense of place, of time, or means. It also means through as the grounds or reason by which something is or is not done. The second Greek word is lepto, which means to leave behind, forsake, to lag, be inferior, destitute, fail, or be wanting. Thus, Pray without ceasing could alternatively be translated as pray until nothing is left behind or leave nothing forsaken in prayer. In either case, the issue in context is not so much an endless prayer marathon to be envied in the Guinness Book World of Records, but rather the concept in context is that God is encouraging those who are believers to earnestly and humbly bring everything in their life before God the Father through prayer. It tells those who are his children to make prayer a way of life and to maintain the conversation of prayer in all that we do. It encourages God's people to persevere and don't give up on prayer or on God. Question 8. Is there a difference between private and public prayer? 
Yes, and in fact, there are three distinctive forms for prayer. The three are private, public, and national. The first is private prayer. Private prayer is, for the most part, fairly self-explanatory. Private prayers are those communications, petitions, confessions, praise, and quieting of one's heart and spirit held in secret between an individual believer and God. The discourse is solitary and personal. It is not displayed or open to the public. The exception to this is prayer held jointly between a man and a woman within the covenant of marriage. Since God has joined a man and a woman together as one flesh in the covenant of marriage, then a married couple can pray jointly in union and purpose and still be praying under the umbrella of private prayer. The second form of prayer is public prayer. Public prayers are those communications, petitions, and praise made by one or more persons in a venue open to the public. While God invites and is always open to prayer in private or in public, we find that Scripture does give guidelines for prayers made in public. Following are some examples. Public prayer should not be used as a time to confess details of personal sins, grievances, or to catch up on personal devotion in private prayer. Public prayer should never be used to gossip or spread rumors about specific people under the pretense of praying for their needs or sins. The details, real or imagined, of other people's lives should remain absolutely confidential. Public prayer emphasizes appropriate concerns for a collective group, either immediately or generally known by those praying. Hence, the petitioner should properly use plural pronouns such as we, our, and or us, rather than I, me, or my. Plural pronouns allow for communal inclusiveness, ratification, and agreement, while singular pronouns force others to listen in isolation. Public prayer also strives for unification, agreement, and ratification of biblical petitions through prayer. At the same time, multiple verbatim requests and repetition should be avoided. Public prayer should be orderly and should avoid slang, profanity, or stilted language. It should avoid any action, verbal or visible, which distracts from directing worship, honor, praise, and attention to God, or which draws unnecessary or unwarranted attention to the one praying. Public prayer should avoid ambiguous or vague language with requests which are overly broad and or general. Instead, strive to keep requests and petitions specific. It is important that requests be scripturally sound, measurable, and attainable. And lastly, public prayer should avoid lengthy dissertations and diatribes. Public prayer time is not the venue to compensate for lack of personal prayer time, nor is it a time for the one petitioning to attempt impressing those around them with their supposed spiritualness. Lastly, number three, we have national prayer. National prayers are those communications, petitions, confessions, and praise made on the part of two or more persons for the sins of a people or a nation. The purpose and goal of the prayers are focused on repentance, rebellion, revival, and any other issues which affect the spiritual health of a people or a nation. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 is typically the verse used which gives authorization and promise for this fact, which says, quote, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear them from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land, unquote. This concludes part two of our study. Please join me for the conclusion part three. Thank you for listening. The, the world falls